hello, um, I'm Fine Specimen Retreat, or Kate. Uh, I'm voicing Aradia today, and thank you for having me. Oh, well, hi, I'm Nagisa, or Elliot, or whatever floats your boat, I suppose. Uh, I'm here as Tavros. You're enjoying a brisk, head-clearing walk in the Alternian moonlight when the plot comes screaming towards you. Literally. You don't even have time for introspection. <coughs> you turn your head to see a guy in a wheelchair whizzing down a nearby hill. He's got a phone in one hand, making it difficult for him to control his descent with the other. You quickly rush over in time to see him hit a rock and go flying through the air with an impressive arc. Oh. You bring the fallen wheelchair over to him. He stares at you for a second and then pulls himself back into it with a grunt. Thank you, weird and ugly alien stranger. Once you've settled into the chair, you look over at the boy you just helped. He's lanky and scrawny except for his oversized horns, giving the impression of a boy going through a very awkward puberty. His wheelchair is simple and flimsy and it looks like it's gone through a lot of wear and tear. Oh, introductorily speaking, uh, I should say that my name is Tavros. Tavros? As is now usual for you, the name sounds familiar even though you're not sure any of your other friends mentioned him by name. You give him a proper greeting and then ask what happened, and he nods toward an old watchtower at the top of the hill. I was attempting to scale toward the tower to acquire a rare feeder spawn go monster what is named Olapine. It's ranked uh, Aether Mythic Triple Rare class, which is one of the rarest of all, at least concerning monsters that can be found in lower, blo lower blooded neighborhoods. But it appears to be tragically out of, out of my reach, no matter how much I believe in my ability to pursue it. You don't know what a Fetu spawn is, but maybe you could help? You've wrangled a few monsters in your time. What? You know, you could help push him up the hill, maybe fight some giant horrifying beast, the usual. Wow, I normally am expected to do everything myself, always. The only trolls who offer, who offer me help are those who live too far away to actually do anything of consequence. Which is fine, I get it, but it's pretty useless to me. No. What? I don't want your help. On account of if I take it, I will be weakening myself and failing to grow as a troll. I will just have to try again and again and get grievously, grievously hurt in the process, probably. Don't worry. Tavros begins to wheel back toward the hill. You know how this story goes. You'll have to spend your entire evening convincing this poor troll boy that it's okay to accept help from others. You launch into a gentle pitch about how help from a friend can... Oh, uh, well, if you say so then, I accept your help. Oh, that was easy. You follow Tavros up the hill. When he reaches the steepest part, his wheels begin to lose traction, you step in behind him to give him the little push he needs. The two of you are successful in scaling the hill, and Tavros grins and taps at his phone. Oh, it's... a phone game? No real monsters involved? Holy shit, this is new to you. Yes! Wolf Alpine is now acquired! Thank you so greatly! Maybe the cartoons for Wigglers were right all along. Their friendship is truly the greatest source of power to exist. Finally, someone who gets you. You ask if he wants a quick ride home and he tilts his head in confusion. I already have a ride. Always. I'm sitting in it. Not like that. You tell him it's hard to explain. Just trust you on this one. Okay, let's go. And with that, you grip his chair and focus your energy and zap on over to his hive. Whoa, are you magic? Yes. Awesome. Do you know any fairies? No. Chucks. Tavros glances around the room and you follow suit. Your eyes settle on an advertisement for the theatrical run of Pupa Pan. 
A pinch of special stardust is all it takes to fly. Brought to you by Her Imperious Condescension's 19th favorite theater company, reserved seating for high bloods, hecklers will be culled. The rest of the room is rather plain and sparsely decorated. The floor is scattered with messy gaming supplies. So, uh, this is my hive? What do you think? Would you characterize this pad as sufficiently cool? You glance at a framed picture of a fey trickster in booty shorts. Sure, yeah, this pad is cool as hell. Excellent, I hoped you would. Your approval is most good to have. I thought you might be uninterested on account of me being boring and kind of sad. Aw, boring and sad kids are your favorite, you tell Tavros. Wait, that sounds terrible. Ignore that. You mean you relish the opportunity to make people less sad? Oh, don't worry then, because I'm definitely sorrowful enough to satisfy. Also, I'm not great at talking either, so we have at least one point of failure in common. Uh, thanks? Tavros flashes you a thumbs up and a wink. He wheels closer to you, and one of his scattered cards crunches under a tread and gets stuck, necessitating a bit of finagling. You must admit, you're a little surprised by the wheelchair. Your experiences on Alternia would suggest that their culture is not very kind to the disabled. Oh, it very isn't. There is a long story behind the fact of me being like this. Kanaya says not to talk about it because it hurts my self-esteem. Oh, okay, that's fine. You turn your attention to some of his cards. Perhaps he can teach you? Well, if you insist, I will reveal to you my tragic backstory. I used to be more of a hardcore gamer who would do the extreme role plays. And I had a friend, or I thought she was my friend, who I did flarp with. Oh, you're familiar with flarp. You're a scrappy doer. Come to think of it, you've got a great flarp friend who he might love to meet. Well, I don't play anymore, be because this old friend of mine did a bad thing to me, resulting in a chain of revenge that was very tragical. Essentially, the story is that I was thrown off a cliff, psychiatrically, and became heavily injured, which resulted in my legs not working. Oh god, that sounds terrible. The culprit continues to hassle me sometimes in ways which are supposedly remorseful, but mostly continue to make me feel bad. For instance, trying to make me learn how to climb stairs, or, or fight better, or telling me I'm useless and awful because I can't. Although, she also sent me this four-wheel device, which helps me to not be cold, so that's nice, I guess. Uh... Although, maybe she wouldn't have done that if Kanaya didn't say to. I don't know, she's hard to understand. Sometimes very nice, and other times extremely not nice, and I can't figure out how she truly feels about me. Wow, this girl Tavros is talking about seems like a real piece of work. You sure are glad none of your friends are anything like that. Yeah, but maybe it's best not to think about her, actually. Kanae was right. Why don't I teach you how to play? Tavros! Tavros freezes up instinctively. Oh, oh no. Th that's her. Th the one who injured me. Oh no. Your spine ice is over. You recognize that telltale exaggerated call. But how can this be? How could your dear, sweet, precious friend Briska have done such a horrible thing to okay no this tracks? Maybe she did do one thing wrong. But why? This isn't like the other kids she killed. You know Vriska is violent and volatile. She had to be to survive, but to harass Tavros after the fact instead of just feeding him to her Lucis? It doesn't make sense. You feel sick to your stomach. Hey, Tavros! You haven't been answering my messages. We need to talk. Her voice comes from outside the window as it moves around the perimeter of the house. You glance at Tavros's stricken face as you hear the sound of keys jingling in a lock. Fuck, she has the keys to his house? <laughs> Tavros groans and leans back in his chair. Riska barges into the respite block and then freezes up. Oh. Hey. Hey, you say with an awkward wave. Riska seems uncomfortable. 
I didn't know you knew this dork. It's a friendship in progress. Tavros has told you some things about their past together. Ugh. Of course he has. Okay, listen. I know it sounds bad, because it is, and I get that, okay? Way back when... It was less than a sweep ago. I was part of a flarp campaign that went way off the rails, and Tavros ended up getting thrown off a cliff. It was basically my fault. But that's all in the past now. Things are better now. I hooked Tavros up with this sweet wheelchair and everything. It's not that sweet. Shut up, Tavros. I'm talking about how terrible I feel about hurting you. Tavros cringes, and you try to intercede on his behalf. Why is Vriska here? Oh, right. I'm here to extend an olive branch. Very magnanimously so, if you ask me. It's time for some action. You're in, right? Uh, I... No? What do you mean, no? I mean, I don't really want to do anything exciting or dangerous like that. And especially because you're going to be involved. I don't think it would be good for me to also be. Oh, come on. Things are totally square between us, Tavros. We all got hurt. Besides, I'm just trying to help you live up to your potential. You could be somebody. You could finally start living up to your legacy. I don't want to be somebody. At least, not your kind of somebody. Tough luck, Toreador. None of us get that choice. If nothing changes by the time your rites of maturation roll around, you're screwed. The drones will cull you in an instant. Riska turns to you, her eyes wide, her fists trembling. Her frustrated glare barely conceals the desperation beneath. I mean, you agree with me, right? Tavros needs to shape up. He needs us. It's time we put the past behind us and moved on. I'm just trying to help him. She leans closer. It's obvious she wants you to back her up. So first, we are going to side with Vriska. You can't resist her force of personality. When Vriska speaks, it just sounds right. You tell Tavros that he should accept Vriska's offer. Hell yeah! See, Tavros? My buddy here agrees. Let bygones be bygones. Uh, uh... Tavro shrinks into his chair, small and sad. The two of you just stare at him as the awkward silence swirls like mist around you. Briska clenches her fist and steps forward, but you quickly put a hand on her shoulder and she pauses. Ugh. Being around here was depressing, and someone doesn't want my help anyway. Whatever. Come on, Slappy the Mailman. I've had enough bull for one night. Let's go chill out somewhere less boring. Like... I don't know, an arcade? Maybe a movie theater? <laughs> what do people without a Lucis to take care of even do? You suggest to Vriska that you can find out together. She beams. Uh, okay. B bye, I guess. Tavros seems conflicted, as though he can't decide whether to be relieved that Vriska's leaving or upset that you're abandoning him. You don't really care, though. You're going to an arcade. Yeah, bad end. <laughs> yeah, let us side with Tavros. You take a step closer to Tavros, and Vriska visibly deflates. Come on, Slappy the Mailman. You can't seriously be on his side. Yes, you can be, and you are. You think you understand now. You see how Vriska took her suffering and bitterness and passed it along. You see how, under beastly tutelage, she learned to sink her fangs into her prey and tell herself she was doing it for their good. In these two, you see a microcosm of Alternia, of hurt kids hurting kids until finally the buck stops at the kindest or weakest among them. So no matter how much sympathy you have for her, you can't stand idly by and let Vriska continue this cycle of hurt. You tell Vriska to look at Tavros, really look at him, and ask herself if her help has done anything for him. Isn't this the kind of suffering that she and Terezi want to prevent? Right now, the best thing she can do for Tavros is to leave him alone. Leave him alone? You don't get it. None of you do. If I leave him alone, he's toast. Seriously, how have you not figured this out by now? You've seen what this planet is like. You think we can just flip a switch and fix everything over day? He's a worthless loser living in a world that hates losers. And if that doesn't change, he's gonna die a sad, pathetic death. 
and you and Kanaya and everyone else, you're just enabling him. When he croaks, it's gonna be on your head, not mine. So if you'd rather hang out with Tavros in his make-believe fairyland, be my guest. But some of us are still going to be living here in the real world. You and Vriska spend a while staring at one another. All you can muster is a look of pity, which only seems to incense her further. Her face scrunches up and then goes steely and flat. Her voice is icily calm. You two have your fun. I'm out. Riska slams the door shut as she leaves. Tavros exhales a long sigh of relief. Well, that went pretty well for an encounter with Riska, all things considered. I only feel somewhat terrible about who I am. Slowly, gently, you place a comforting hand on Tavros' shoulder and tell him that he deserves better than this. It's not his fault. Riska is... difficult. Yeah, Kanaya says that too. I sometimes almost believe her when she does. The room is silent except for a faint wriggling noise coming from some of the balls on Tavros's floor. You don't know what else to say. Would you, uh, enjoy playing some beauty spawn with me, perhaps? As a matter of distraction? Oh, fuck yes, you tell him. Let's spawn some Fidu. Fiduces? Yeah. Your Florp experience inured you to Alternian game design, so you're only mildly nauseated when Tavros shows you how the physical version of Fidu spawn works. Chitinous purple critters explode from gooey orbs and infect plushies before bursting out in the form of large monsters with more limbs than you're comfortable with. Also, you have a handful of cards which boost your, their attributes or allow you to interfere with your opponent's monsters. There's a lot to keep track of here. Before too long, the room is full with chittering purple monstrosities and queasy-looking host plushes on the verge of birthing even more abominations. You are so lost. But you think you're winning? Your creature appears to be doing a better job of preying on his host plushes and spawning more of themselves. You've got a meter in the corner that keeps going up while his goes down. That's good, right? You think it's good, at least where victory is concerned? But you are more concerned with the, de with the dejected look on Tavros' face. He doesn't seem to be giving the game his all. You ask him if he's doing okay. No. Oh, okay, he just came out and said it. My fun has been stymied, I think, by my thoughts about Riska. He wheels himself over to the window and looks despondently out. I used to like Riska a lot, you know, and admire her for her many qualities that were good, such as being very confident or having skill at games. But now I just hate her, or feel like I should hate her, but instead do not feel those feelings. In their place, I feel very conflicted and bad about myself, and wonder if there's something wrong that I can't feel as angry as I should, or make myself to become strong enough to talk to her properly about my feelings. It's just... A big mess. You glance again at the posters lining Tavros's walls. Sprightly fairy girls with confident smiles, long messy hair and blue color schemes. The resemblance to Briska is uncanny, but superficial. She's never going to be like the girl from his posters. That's just not who Briska is. But for a sad, hurt boy who likes to dream, she must seem so painfully close. This is a problem too big for you to untangle right now. You need to redirect Tavros' thoughts. You close your eyes and ask your intuition, what should you do? And we are going to help him fly. From the darkness, you reach into your muddled memories and catch a glint of glimmering gold. When you open your eyes, Pupa Pan stares back at you. Unlike him, you don't have special stardust, but you think you might have something better. You tell Tavros he'll be right back. Sort of. The now familiar Prospecian Spires greet you. You swoop through the shiny architecture until you find those towers that seem to house the dreaming children. Sure enough, Tavros' dream self can be found in one in one tower and nestled comfortably in a recuperacoon. You poke him on the cheek. No response. You give him a little shake. Nothing. With a sigh, you rear back your hand and slap him. Hard. Tavros remains asleep. He's practically comatose. Why? This feels so off. Karkat is awake and Tavros isn't? 
and something about that is just wrong. It's all wrong. How can you help Tavros under these circumstances? He's got to wake up. Tavros yawns, and he rises blearily from his slumber and squints around. He crawls out of the recuperacoon and reaches over to the ramp beside it with an instinctual motion. His hands find no wheelchair, and he tumbles over, and then quickly rises and realizes with a start that he's floating in midair. Whoa! What? Surprise! You informed Tavros that this is the mystical world of dreams, that is part of the game he was supposed to play one day, but now isn't going to? Maybe? Probably? You'll be honest, you still don't know exactly how this works. But you do know that this is a land where you can fly. That seems highly improbable that such a world would exist. Or especially that I would be allowed to enter it and fly freely around with no repercussions. It just seems like a thing that would never eventually happen to me, does it not? But it is happening, you tell him. You prove it by pinching his arm. He flinches. Uh, why did you just assault me? It's... it's a thing. Pinching is... okay. This is a cultural misunderstanding. But the fact that he can feel pain should prove that this place is real. Or at least as real as a magic dream world can be. I see. My arm does certainly hurt in a realistic manner, as well as my feelings due to the uncalled for attack from a friendly individual. Oh, for fuck's sake. You tell Tavros to stop worrying about that and start unworrying about how he can fly now. Oh, yeah. With unsteady movements, Tavros begins to circle his dream room. He holds his hands out as he sails around, floating upwards and dipping down. He seems to get the hang of it quickly. And as he does, his face cracks into a warm smile. Oh, 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 this feels really amazing! At your invitation, Tavros follows you out the window and sees Prospet stretching towards him. His eyes go all starry. Can I really explore all of this area? He can, you tell him. Probably, just don't go barging into anyone's houses. Hell, okay! Tavros does loops and twirls, pirouettes around spires, and weaves through, th uh, through throngs of Prospician civilians. He hoots and hollers, the anxious crescendo in his voice nearly absent. The sound echoes among the golden towers and rebounds back at you, a cacophony of childlike exhilaration. You swoop alongside him, buoyed by his excitement, and the two of you begin to race each other around the planet. You run out of energy before Tavros does, but eventually he comes down from his high. He floats lazily beside you, upside down, his mohawk hanging down into his face. His eyes are locked on the sky and clouds, and he's wearing a wide, if oddly blank, grin. Hey! I want to thank you for doing this for me, allowing me to feel this freedom and joy. It really means a lot. You grin and give him a thumbs up. You're glad you could help. Yeah, me too. You glance up at the clouds. How long have you been out here? You figure it's probably time to head back to the real world. You tell him you'll teleport back and then wake him up. What? Oh no, don't wake me up, please. I don't want to go back to that life when I could spend my days here forever feeling blissful and, and happy for once. You pause. That's not the response you were expecting, although you suppose you should have seen this coming. What about his friends? His responsibilities in the waking world? What happens when the drones come knocking? Well, those are some pertinent questions which I don't care about, though. This is where I am happy, and where I belong. That's what you wanted, right? To help me be happy? Right. Then your work here is done. He smiles at you, and you feel like you should smile back, but there's a hint of sadness behind his eyes that gives you pause. It's like he's waiting for you to take charge and tell him off for choosing escapism, waiting for you to make the hard decision he doesn't have the guts to make. But that's not the kind of person you are. If he'd rather spend most of his time asleep, that's good enough for you. Given the planet he lives on, you can't blame him. So you give him a little wave and vanish into the ether of cannon. By the time he works up the nerve to say something, you're already gone. Yep. 
sleeping forever. All right, we are going to stay grounded. From the darkness, you reach into your muddled memories and catch a glint of cold iron. When you open your eyes, Pupa Pan stares back at you. He would have you believe that faith is all it takes to fly, but you think Tavros could use something a little more material. You put a gentle hand on his shoulder and ask him what you can do to help him spread his wings. His metaphorical wings, that is. It's not like he could even sprout real ones. The very thought is, is absurd. Tavros sighs. I just wish I could live more independently, I guess. To take charge of my life and become less under Vriska's thumb. You think Tavros could use some better friends? Real friends? I do have some. Nepeta is very kind to me often. Gamzee and I like to throw down sick rhymes, and Kanaya tries to help me with Friska. But there's not a lot they can do when we live far away. And as nice as my Lucis is, he's unable to help me with all my issues due to his small size limiting him to only moving and carrying small objects to me when I require them. The simple fact is that I didn't build my hive with the expectation of one day using a four-wheeled device to navigate it. Can Tavros move to a better hive? Could you help him with that? No. As a bronze, the stipend I receive is not enough to cover such things. Even this four-wheeled device, which is highly basic compared to some high-blood models, would have cost me over a wipe's worth of savings. Okay. Your changes are available to me, economically speaking, especially if I want to not alert drones to my unsuitedness for true expectations. You see, if money is the issue, that's not something you can help him with, at least not directly. But you might know others who can. You tell Tavros that you're going to step out for a moment to fetch a mutual friend. He seems briefly surprised when you return with Kanaya. You guess you don't blame him. This strikes you as a pretty rare pairing, conversationally speaking. Oh, Kanaya. It's nice to see you. In person, unexpectedly. Wow, my hive is terrible looking. Sorry, but hi. You look nice. Yes, I do. How are you faring? Has my advice regarding the construction of an imaginary friend? Steam? Well, I haven't really got to try it yet, so no, it hasn't, I guess. Kanaya suppresses a sigh. Okay. Well, let's get directly to business. I've brought some materials with which to renovate your hive. Oh! Please advise us as to how best we design the place to suit your needs. Tavros' eyes water up and he sniffs, leaning forward in his chair. <laughs> really? You would do that for me? Despite it taking a large portion of time and effort, and presumably money as well? I don't really spend my stipend on much besides fabric. And I intend to twist Riska's arm until she offers a portion of her flocking treasure to put the bill too. And of course I'd do it for you. Any less would be a rejection of my helpful sensibilities. Kanaya says it with a neutral tone and a straight face, as if there's nothing remarkable about it, but Tavros nevertheless breaks into a grin. Oh, wow! Thanks! Okay, give me some time to develop ideas on how to properly jack this hive up and deliver the most utterly dope and pimped up changes. This is gonna be so great! You give Tavros the requested time and then begin the work in earnest. You weren't sure what to expect, but the construction process moves smoother than anticipated. Kanaya brings a set of alien devices which she claims to have borrowed from a sea dwelling friend of hers. One converts raw materials into a strange substance that reminds you of fruit gushers. Kanaya fells trees with her chainsaw and feeds them into the machine, and before long you have a trove of the gusher things. The other device expends the gushers to modify buildings. It has a holographic click-and-drag interface, much like The Sims played in real life. You find this construction software to be incredibly handy, and also eerily familiar, but honestly you find everything eerily familiar these days. Yes, it's very convenient. Home construction has been an important part of troll culture for as long as history remembers. 
Most do not why, although to me the reason is obvious. Preparation for the game, which we will now no longer be playing, to outside interference. Wait, she knows about that? Yes. I figured out what was going on a day or two after you visited me, but I thought it prudent not to get particularly dramatic about it all. That was very thoughtful of her. Yeah. I try. Kanaya finishes feeding logs into the first device and begins to manipulate Tavros's hive with the other. Together, you are a clockwork team. Tavros provides directions, Kanaya implements them with her stellar sense of design, and you provide moral support by standing around looking cute. Okay, yes. Nudge that shelf over to the left. Y yeah, like that. Wait, actually, right. Further, or, okay, no, 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 go, go back. A bit more. That's almost good. Now, make it a little tad higher. Yes, no, no, lower. There, there, right there. And... Yes! Perfect, I think. Okay, actually, can you go back to where it first was? In the end, it takes until the next day to finish construction, which is actually great time. You were expecting to have to zap forward once or twice for the sake of narrative brevity, but with the Alternian build tools, Tavros's hive is swiftly renovated. It is far more spacious than it once was, with ramps and rails aplenty. Under Tavros's guidance, you've widened hallways, lowered counters, revamped bathrooms. It's like a brand new house. You don't have a ribbon to cut in celebration, so Tavros summons some bizarre fetus spawn creature to shoot confetti all over the entire- all around the entrance to the hive. It's all gross and sticky and you hate every second of it, but he's having fun. After that, Tavros spends a while just exploring the hive. He wheels himself through each block, awed by the ease which he can navigate the space. By the time he returns to his respite block, his grin is radiant. You take it he likes this new place. Oh, yes! This pad is now genuinely frigid. It makes me feel more confident, like the world is my bivalve jewel container. Like I can say to Riska, fuck you! I won't do what you tell me, biatch! Okay, I won't say that probably, but I could. Actually, maybe I will say that, as well as plenty of other deliriously rude things which long I have avoided saying. Okay, that's probably enough, you tell him. Kanaya is staring icily at him, but he doesn't seem to notice. You suggest that it's a good time to settle down, the sun's gonna be rising pretty soon. Right. Well, we still have some moonlight. Would you like to stay for a while, Kanaya, and play some games with us? Oh no, that's quite all right. I'm afraid I have duties to attend to at home. I... left a dress in the oven. Kanaya blinks and carefully maintains her poise. It's... made out of clay, you see. It's get- I'm getting experimental. Oh, that makes sense. Well, goodbye. You smile- she smiles at Tavros and shoots you a pointed glance. You take it as your cue to place a hand on her shoulder, concentrate on her hive, and send her back in a flash of light. Once she's gone, Tavros wheels up to you and nudges you in the hip. So, regarding Kanaya, this could perhaps be me misreading the situation, but when I reach deep inside and tap into the marvelous power of the self esteem it tells me that I'm very right and smart. Did you see the way that she was smiling at me? Almost in a way as to suggest amorous inclinations. Uh, uh... He waggles his eyebrows furiously in your direction. Oh, jeez. You tell Tavros that it's just uh, what friendship looks like. She's not his type. Trust me, you say. Drat. But, oh well. I think there is a saying about this, that the sea has many fish in it. Now that I am feeling better, I think perhaps I will one day go fishing for a quadrant or two. Well, it's a start. It's gonna take some time for this kid to figure out what genuine self-esteem is like. But just like the Prospecian clouds part to reveal a brilliant sky in blue, 
You think Tavros is on the verge of seeing the sun? Uh, the moon? This metaphor would work better on Earth. Tavros can be more than he is, and he doesn't need to change to do it. When he offers you a smile, there's a spark of compassion behind it that tells you he's already worth the world. All he ever needed was someone to believe in him. And money. He also needed money. So, would you like to perhaps celebra celebratorily play a round or two of Fidu Spawn with me? I am feeling much more prepared to enjoy a game, and perhaps think that this time I will proceed to crush you with my incredible might as a Fidu Spawn breeder. Except, I mean that in a nice way, like that of a friendly challenge. Uh, if you'll accept. The word friend in that sentence was all you needed to hear. Victory. What are you doing here? What are you doing on this awful planet? You walk. You walk and you don't stop walking. You walk until the moons are high in the sky and the lights from the city all but fade away. You walk until you can't think about anything but walking anymore. Then you zap. 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 Who cares? You just want to be out of here. What's happening to you? What are these thoughts? What are these half-remembered truths? Why do all your new friends seem so fresh but so familiar? You are lost inside yourself for what simultaneously feels like both a moment and an eternity. You stop walking and lay down. The grass feels cool on the back of your head and your eyes. Your eyes feel so heavy. Troll Ooh. Jesus Christ! Inches away from your face, someone is bent over you and staring unblinkingly into your eyes. In a single panicked motion, you do a youthful sideways roll and spring to your feet. This doesn't seem to startle her at all. She doesn't move from her precariously balanced squat. She's just looking at you. Observing you. Is she waiting for you to do something? After exactly 21 seconds of staring directly at you, she offers an entirely too toothy smile. Part of you suspects she just remembers that what you do in these situations. She examines you with obvious curiosity. Not the worst decision. To nap among the remains of the deceased. <laughs> what? With a sarcastic motion that suggests looking literally anywhere around you, she draws your attention to what appears to be some sort of dig site. You seem to have fallen asleep in a pile of bones. On her shirt is emblazoned with a dark red Aries symbol. Oh, cool, another Zodiac kit. You must have said Aries out loud because she immediately corrects you. It's pronounced Aradia. Thank you, James Roach. That makes sense. Although you've just met, you cannot fathom her name being pronounced in any other way. Your new potential friend Aradia is looking a little... What is polite? What's a polite and charming way of saying rough around the edges? Her clothes are a bit shabby, but maybe that's just normal wear and tear when you've been hanging out in the dirt all day. What is she doing out here in the dirt anyway? I come out here to dig up bones. Oh, like, uh, archaeology? Oh yes, that too. Bones are an important part of the life cycle. You often hear about the beauty of life but I find that death is just as important and fascinating. The finality of death has a beauty to it. Or it used to. You want to ask what she means, but it must be written all over your face. She very quickly moves on. Remains can tell us a lot about their owners. How they lived. How they met their end. Is that not a little wonderful? Fossils represent a finality. A moment locked in time. It is the physical that remains while the spirit moves on. Everything that made them who they were is gone. When all is said and done, it's only the bone that survived to tell us their tale. And in that way, death is sort of a perfection, don't you think? Their violent end is a sort of peace. Nothing left but the bones. You've never thought about it that way. In fact, you suspect you may have never thought about anything as much as this girl has thought about bones. Oh, bones are just one of my many interests. Oh, yeah, uh, you too. Big bone fan over here. 
I see you are also a person of exquisite taste. <laughs> well, damn. Oh, woe to you, too. Your stomach growls a little bit. Just how long were you out here? I discovered your body several hours ago. I thought you might be dead, so I was watching you to confirm my suspicions. She was watching what she thought was a dead body for several hours? Yes. On the lookout for early signs of decomposition. Rot. Rigor mortis, etc. Unfortunately, you are not completely dead. Thank goodness for that. I guess. Wait, what does she mean, completely? There is a moment where her unbreaking, if not somewhat unsettling grin leans more towards normal. Well, okay, someone might describe it as normal if maybe you'd never seen anyone smile before. Like, if you were passing someone in the hallway and they described what a smile was to you and you were like, No, no, I got this. Alas, you digress. You are like me. The dead speak to you. You would do well to pay attention. A mantle of doomed souls leashed to you. I wonder just how many times you have died. Died? Like, bereft of life? She sits down beside you. She picks up some sort of rib or femur or pelvis or whatever and begins to idly draw on the dirt. It's a crude drawing of some sort of misshapen stick person. Unrelatable. Traditionally, yes, that is what dying means. But you are different. I can see the ghosts of all your alternate iterations floating around you. Trying to help you. Doomed timelines that have been purposefully erased from your consciousness. But you're the culmination of the choices you've made, fatal or otherwise. You've been forced to leave so much behind you. Your memories. Despite the fact that she seems so very focused on her dirt art, you suddenly feel so seen. Someone doesn't want you to remember. But... She looks at you and leans in close. Do you want to know a secret? Wait, did she just say ghosts? You're really not following. Sounds kind of fake if you're being honest. Ghosts? Yeah, okay, you've seen some weird shit on this planet, but you draw the line at ghosts. The spooky bit was kind of charming and cool at first, but this is borderline ridiculous. Oh. She almost looks hurt. Her tone turns hollow. How disappointing. Aradia rises and turns her back towards you. The night air feels cold, which it hadn't before. Perhaps on behalf of the especially cold shoulder treatment you're getting right now. Little bumps form on your skin. I have misjudged you. I thought I could trust you, but... Maybe you are just like the rest. I'm okay with that. It does not bother me. She's floating several feet off the ground. Typically, this is your sign to say, not to say, hmm, sounds like it kind of does bother you. We're going to give in to your need to feel like you know better than everyone. Hmm, sounds like it kind of does bother her. Sounds like she probably isn't okay with it. She is silent for what seems like several minutes. Have your words reached her? When she turns to you, her eyes are white and her expression is blank. Her head tilts to the side as if she's looking at a curious bauble, her face unchanging. Nothing really bothers me anymore. Oh, Jesus. No thanks, this secret sucks. Time to fucking go. Sorry, you said ghosts were fake or whatever bullshit. Yes, maybe that would be best for both of us. I had some hope for you. But it looks like that was misplaced. There's a hollow disappointment in her voice. You've never been negged by a ghost before. She raises a hand to you, her form silhouetted by the twin moons. There's a blissful moment where you feel suspended and still. Better luck next time? We're gonna say, wait, did she just say ghosts? Again. Keep your mouth shut for once. You keep quiet. Now is not the time for your incredible insights. The restraint you have shown here will surely be rewarded. She turns to you slowly, dangling somewhat limply in the air. This act was for your benefit, but to proceed any further is pointless. 
Her eyes are white. Her face is unreadable. Oh my god, ghosts are real too? Alternia is fucked up. Boo. Oh Jesus, no thanks. The secret sucks. Time to fucking go. Sorry you said ghosts were fake or whatever bullshit. Yes, maybe that would be best for both of us. I had some hope for you. But it looks like that was misplaced. There's a hollow disappointment in her voice. You've never been negged by a ghost before. She raises a hand to you, her form silhouetted by the twin moons. There's a blissful moment where you feel suspended and still. Better luck next time again. What happens if we say it third time? You're really not following. Sounds kind of fake, if you're being honest. Ghosts? Yeah, okay, you've seen some weird shit on this planet, but you draw the line at ghosts. The spooky bit was kind of charming and cool at first, but this is borderline ridiculous. Oh, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> he just starts you over. You have never wanted anything more in your entire life. You have to admit you are a little fascinated by this line of inquiry. You don your signature cool person facade and tell her there is nothing in this godforsaken universe that will keep you from hearing that secret. You throw in that you're going to die if you don't find out immediately. Smooth as butter, baby. You don't know how relieved I am to hear that. The way she speaks has shifted slightly. It sounds fuller, livelier. That's good? Oh yes, I have been alive for some time now. All according to plan. When she says the word time, her eyebrows lift a little as if cueing you in on a joke she seems to think you're completely familiar with. You give it a, a polite chuckle. What a character. She beams and there's a moment you forgot that she was talking about ghosts and secrets. They can't find us here. We have made them ma very mad. They can't find us here? Them? We've? Mad? Made? You don't ask her for clarification on very. You're feeling pretty confident about that one. This is not the first time we have met. Though it is hard to say how long has passed then. Time passes differently out here. Hey, apropos of nothing and far be it from you to comment on someone's appearance, but why does she look so much older? Why is she wearing the magic teen pajamas like John in them? How did she manage to do her makeup so well and just not brush her hair at all? You know with curls the issue might actually be over brushing. You don't want to brag, but you do happen to have an encyclopedic knowledge of hair care products. Has she considered switching to sulfate-free shampoo? God, you wish you had hair. Wow, you ask a lot of questions, but I guess that's natural. Right now, we are outside of the can canonical relevance. You are gonna have to stop her right there. You have had enough of canon and relevancy in what it means, and what is or isn't. Do you people never tire of sniffing your own farts about canonical impact? Wow, rude. Yeah, you're rude now. Fuck the narrative. Absolutely phenomenal, and I could not agree more. Like I was trying to explain, out here, even the powers that can't, that be can't hear us. I must say, I'm a big fan of your work. I've seen quite a few do doomed timelines before, but nothing like this. You are something they had no contingency plans for, and Paradox Space is practically falling apart at its seams. This timeline has been peppered with inconsistencies and clues. Things here and there that cannot exist yet. Events that occur too early. I figured you were doing it on purpose, so I thought I'd get your attention. But you are a little broken, aren't you? She looks disappointed as she says this. You don't know why she would want your attention, but she has it. It is not only your attention I want. The power is shifting, and the ones pulling the strings are distracted with their own meaningless- You really can't remember anything, can you? You tell her you remember some things that you can't explain. Names of things. Hints of the past. Whispers of ghosts. Wait, how does she know this? Yes, they have been whispering to you quite loudly. They are the fractured remnants of your departed self, and they have been trying to help you get here at this exact moment. 
you ask where and when, here is exactly. As you look around, the scenery seems to shift. Sometimes you're inside, sometimes you're outside, sometimes you're in all places at once. You swear you see some shadow of your friends here and there, but places they don't really belong. Why would Rose be in Kanaya's hut? Do they know each other? You want to know what's going on and why it's so important that you're here. Wherever here is. I asked an old friend's ghost to tell an ancient space squid to burp up a place for us to meet. As one does? Sure. Think of it as a liminal space made of the same thing memories are. I have spent a lot of time in the furthest spring and in these bubbles and trying to figure out how they work. So I have some ideas. But I don't think the ones who conceive them even really know exactly what matters is the specific path you took to get here. It took you many tries, but you made it! You get the feeling the more this is spelled out, the less sense it will make. Kinda kills the magic. Yes. That is probably true of most things. Instead of explaining it to you, it was easier just to rewind things and have you try again. You're almost too embarrassed to ask how many times it took you to get it right. She puts her hand on your shoulder and just shakes her head. Oh. The important thing is you made it. I tried so many things to get you here. One time, I pretended to be a ghost. Ooh. She affects a spooky tone, sort of waving her fingers around. Since accidentally entering the medium, your particular class and aspect combination have given you knowledge and foresight you shouldn't have. But here, where the connection to every version of yourself is strongest, we can do a little housekeeping. She reaches her hand out to yours. Oh, fuck. Is this it? Is this it? You were finally making a friend and all it took was an infinite number of tries? You take her hand and she smiles at you. And then everything goes off the shits. Something flies into you. Oh, fuck. Was that a ghost? You can see them. Oh, fuck. It has your face. There are so many of them. One by one, they slam into you. The entirety of their lives and each of their deaths play out before you in real time. Aradia clutches your hand and begins to laugh in a way that makes you start to think that maybe this wasn't a great idea. <laughs> but... You remember. You remember all of them. As the last doomed version of yourself is absorbed into your body, you collapse out of both physical and mental exhaustion. You are back in the dirt. Back in the bone pile. You just sort of turn over and lay there for a second. Oh my god! Malik? Tizius? Bull deer? Oh, little demon! Zeb? Uh, okay, maybe, maybe not that guy. But there is still a gap. Why are you here? You look down at the, ho uh, the hoodie Malik gave you. Didn't Karkat's friends say nobody had used this symbol for a long time? I am afraid I don't know exactly. My abilities have allowed me to tidy up your timeline path. Tentative canon. You roll your eyes. She ignores you and continues. So whatever happened to you outside of the narrative is beyond my capacity as a guide of the deceased. But I know a way we can find out. It's why I brought you here, to give you back your memories. God, you miss just fucking around about hot dogs. You wonder what your friends are up to now. You think maybe you should check on them. She looks at you in the eyes and you stop rolling them for two seconds. Aren't you tired of being nice? Don't you just want to go ape shit? And we're going to do- Oh! Look at the time! You were supposed to take your punk rock alien daughter off at the mall like a hundred years ago or whatever. Oh my god, your friends. You have to go back. You look at Aradia. This is awkward. You could actually have a prior engagement. Actually, this could work. You extend your hand in the universal come with me gesture. You try to focus on anyone. The comforting chaos of Vardata's house, the burnt-out mall where you promised Daria you'd take her with you. Yes, it's all coming back to you. You are so glad you have an encyclopedic knowledge of that whole adventure before continuing. You zap the both of you onwards. You're in the fucking hallway? There's that T-posing turd! Aradia goes wide-eyed. No! 
Not this time! Eat my whole ass, you nobodies! You conjure the strongest memory you can. Oh my god. You sniffed Marvis's armpit. The shame you are feeling sends you reeling. This is it, you guess? You what?! But nothing is here. You float listlessly in a black void. Why isn't anything here? Where is everyone? You refocus. Maybe that was just a bad point to remember? You pull the strings of your hoodie tight, letting its warmth cover you like a dear friend's embrace. Surely you've spent enough time with Malik's jacket to have formed some sort of secret bond with the memory of him. This will be enough. It needs to be enough. You disappear and reappear in the same spot. You phase in and out over and over and nothing happens. Aradia watches you, but seems to be giving you space to process this. It isn't enough. It was never enough. They're gone. You go limp and just drift for a while. You hear the sad song of some sort of cosmic entity. Its low tones reverberate your entire body, filling you with a sorrow you didn't know you were capable of feeling. An impossibly long tendril appears from the void and slowly makes its way towards you. It gently wraps itself around you. You don't even bother to question it at this point. Wow. On a scale from 1 to 10, how shaken is your fate? Why aren't they here, Aradia? Where is everything? I don't know. But I'm here. Do you want to just vibe out with the space monster for a little while? I kind of do. Yeah, okay, you guess. I do not know where your friends are, or why there isn't anything here. And I am afraid you may not find these answers Puppet Master. But... But? Isn't that fine? Friends and grudges, life and death, existence and nothingness. Isn't it all the same in the end? The only th If this is about bones, you are going to lose your mind. She smiles. Well, I can confidently say it wasn't- it wasn't not about bones. You can't help but laugh a little bit. Do you want to try again? I know there is a different way this goes, but I still wanted to see what you would do. You won't remember anything. Not even our friend here. You think about it for a little bit. The tentacle sort of paps you on the face. Is it trying to comfort you? Eventually, you know that's what has to happen. She will rewind you and tidy up the mess you've made by coming out here. There's a path you needed to follow and you keep trying to cheat it. You ask her to let you sit here for a little bit longer. You don't want to forget just yet. Okay. Okay. Alright, so we're going to do... You want to see this whole place break apart. You think about it for a little bit. You've been gone for so long, and you can go back wherever you want, right? You gotta focus on the friends in the here and now. You know what? Yeah, let's trash this place. You stand up and kick over a small pile of bones. No! My bone! <laughs> oh, oops, sorry. She kneels down next to the carnage and just stares for a little bit. Shit, she looks completely devastated. It's actually kind of hard to watch. You turn away. Aw, oh, biscuits. This is no way to canonize a friendship with a time god. What were you thinking? You're just too damn good at kicking over small piles of shit. Curse these powerful legs. Marvis wouldn't do something like this. That guy was cool as hell. Aradia begins to laugh in a way that someone less eager for friendship might describe as a cackle. <laughs> Look. She has arranged the bones into an outlandish, if not slightly vulgar, configuration. For once, I really am okay with this. I was just lying to you for comedic effect. It's okay. You can laugh. Try it with me. Huh. Huh. Now say it again! Ha. Huh. There you go. I meant apeshit more in the larger sense. I don't think any of them care about bones. They're lost. If you really want to see things fall apart, I can lead you to where you need to be. You don't know who they are. 
and you don't give a single solitary shit. Fuck this place. Fuck whoever took your memories. Let's go absolutely buck wild in this piece. You kick up some dirt and don't even care. Aradia produces a series of abstractions from thin air, some sort of giant Ouija board. The lens spells out sickle, but in Alternian, which you still don't understand why you can read, but you know what, not the weirdest shit happening right now. Karkat's rambunctiously colored sickle appears midair. She hands it to you and excitedly takes your other hand. Let's go. Over the next few hours, you teleport around, both Alternia and Earth, dropping a bunch of seemingly random objects in nonsense places, being careful not to be seen. You change the gift itinerary in John's dad's PDA. You sign the kids up for cell phone plans. Are you just doing chores? This really feels more like running errands than breaking anything. Trust me. They are going to notice and... Oh, I bet they are going to be so steamed. You personally guarantee nobody in their right mind will care about any of this. But the moment the words leave your mouth, something in the distance cracks. You don't see it. You don't hear it. You feel it. You zap to the next location. You steal Vriska's lipstick, and there it is again. A crack. You almost can't believe it. This stupid plan is working. You guess the devil really is in the details. Next to you, Aradia looks absolutely thrilled. Subtle changes in the timeline can have big repercussions, but nothing like this. They usually just create a doomed offshoot, but this is a whole doomed reality. Don't you know what this means? You tell her that you totally do know what it means, but just in case she doesn't know, she should explain it for herself. If you just keep up whatever it is you've been doing, this whole place is gonna come down. Huh. Aradia lifts an air conditioning unit and throws it into the stratosphere with her mind. Wow, that's fucked up. She sits on the edge of the roof, overlooking the city. Thank you. This was fun. A faint crack forms in the sky. The curtains of space and time fall back to reveal a nothingness that does not really make you feel as whole as you hoped. But there is still a bit for you to do. You still have a few more friends to make. What? That's it? You put a crack in reality and then just go back to spending time with some teens? Hmm. Yeah. Aren't you also sort of a teen? You explained that it was never very clear, actually. Well, the answers you want are at the end of your path. The only way to find them is to get them to come to you. And they will. It will all make sense then. You wish that were true. You sit next to her, your legs dangling over the edge of the molding. Before your eyes, the crack in the sky appears, to be sewn shut almost as quickly as it appeared. She was right. Something is happening. The two of you sit in each other's company for what feels like both a moment and an eternity. Good end, you guess? So yeah, thank you all so much for watching, and I will see you all next time.